The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, came forward and put this question to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, If someone's brother dies leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman but died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and likewise all the seven died childless. And finally the woman also died. And now at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like angels, and they are the children of God because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush, when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we have this uh, reading from Luke chapter 20, it's verses 27 through 38, and basically uh, we have to know a little bit of difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and uh, to understand why this is such a big deal for them, they argued among themselves about the resurrection, and it's a simple passage that Jesus is just simply proving the resurrection, and he continues to proclaim the resurrection of the dead. And so again, we as Christians, we live forever. And uh, we have to realize that, especially after we've been baptized, we live forever. Death is only a passage, a transition, uh, a temporary moment in our life, uh, in the fullness of that sense of the word. So Pharisees, they believed in a resurrection. They acknowledged the belief in the resurrection. The Sadducees are the ones who challenged the notion. And so there's this intense disagreement over one of their key elements of their own teachings about the resurrection of the dead. And so the Pharisees, they agree with Jesus on the resurrection uh, because they accepted an oral tradition of interpretation. Uh, For instance, our first reading from Maccabees. Uh, So in the first reading, you may recall uh, the gruesome scene, the seven brothers were being killed for their belief in God, along uh, with in the presence of their mother. And their words and behavior logically make clear that they believed in a resurrection to eternal life. And they even spoke that very thing. And so the Sadducees, on the other hand, they totally rejected the oral Torah, accepting only what was strictly written in it. And so there is no written reference in the Torah about the resurrection. Uh, Maccabees is not the Torah, it's not considered to be the part of the prophets or the writings. They accepted the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, but this Maccabees is some kind of a, a historical uh, warrior uh, 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 documentation of what Maccabeus, Judas Maccabeus did and his uh, son Matthias and his uh, sons after him uh, in order to preserve the religion of Israel. So that did end up in our Bibles. It's not in every Bible, by the way, so uh, stick to the Catholic Bible or the St. Uh, the New New American Bible or the uh, St. Joseph edition, uh, you'll find that as the authentic uh, scripture. Uh, The oral tradition versus the written tradition. So that's what uh, these Pharisees and Sadducees are arguing about. The oral tradition versus the written tradition argument is much like our modern day arguments from the fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians who argue with Catholics saying that's not written in the Bible or where do you find that in the Bible? You might hear this as Catholics 
uh, people accuse us of, you know, oh, that's not in the Bible. Why do you have a Hail Mary? Why do you pray Hail Marys? Well, actually, it is in the Bible. You have to read the first chapter of Luke, but they like to say things that aren't there that actually are there, but some things that aren't there actually aren't there either. So, uh, so you do have to realize those things that, and there's a simple understanding for this. Authentic Christianity comes from Jesus Christ. All right, we can all start there. We can all agree there. And it's handed down from him. Where does it come from? It didn't fall to the sky. Where does the Bible come from? We're not going to get into that. Catholic Church, actually, but never, we won't get into that. All right, but authentic Christianity is handed down from Jesus Christ in three parts. Holy Scripture. No, he didn't write the Bible. Okay. But the three parts of authentic Christianity are Holy Scripture, sacramental life, and yes, oral tradition. All right, how do you think the scriptures came to us? In written form? No, the apostles spoke them first. The prophets spoke them, all right? And then they were written down later. So Holy Scripture, sacramental life, and oral tradition. All three actually came from Jesus because he himself is the one who is working in them. So when the prophets spoke in the Old Testament, Jesus was the word speaking through them. He is the word which is always spoken through the prophets. The prophets don't speak on their own. They speak when they're told to speak. They speak according to what God tells them to speak. In this case, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's always proclaiming. He's been proclaiming from the beginning. All right, so just a simple point there, that the, uh, that the, the Pharisees and scribes argument over the resurrection is a little bit, a lot like, I think, the uh, fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians versus the Catholics, okay, who have this tradition. We rely on tradition, that which has been handed down. Tradition, the word tradition comes from the Latin word tradere, which means to hand down or hand over. Okay, so the Sadducees, uh, they are using a this worldly principle to try to prove that the resurrection from the dead cannot exist because there would be a wife with seven husbands in the afterlife. I think you guys picked up on that, right? That's what they're trying to say. Well, if there's a resurrection and this person is married to another person to another person, then whose wife is she going to be in the afterlife? Okay, I think you guys picked up on that. That's pretty clear there. So that's what they're trying to propose, which is easy for us to follow because we experience this in the world. All right? The law referred here is Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. Uh, that was to guarantee a woman would have a male provider and continue the family line since all kinds of disastrous consequences result if a man dies without an heir or his wife is widowed without a son in that patriarchal culture. The woman is, it's like very, very hard pressed to survive at all. So the entire pattern of thinking when they propose this is family centered and this worldly. The Sadducees are challenging Jesus with a simple question. Do you believe in the written Torah, or do you side with the Pharisees' oral tradition, accepting their belief in the resurrection? And so Jesus obviously knows that there is a resurrection to eternal life, and he, the Pharisees are glad that Jesus is proving the Sadducees wrong. You can, they're happy here, but they're not going to express that to Jesus. All right, But they're happy that Jesus is uh, taking that side of the resurrection, as the Pharisees also take that same side. And they're happy that he is actually proving these Sadducees wrong. The Sadducees are lacking the understanding of a heavenly or a spiritual reality. And when we think about heaven ourselves, we have to recall that it's different than how we experience things on earth. So they're much different from the physical, earthly, family-centered realities and relationships, particularly between man and woman. So Jesus, he tries to move them beyond an only earthly understanding, correcting their thinking by first having to explain to grown men the facts of life and reproduction for the sake of the continuity of the human race. It's why God gave us conjugal life for the production of the human race, to continue the human race. But the reality is that matrimony does not continue into eternity, all right? And we need to realize that. Uh, matrimony does not continue into eternity, all right? The children of this age marry and remarry, as he says. Uh, but in heaven, there is no need for any of the sacraments we practice today, including the sacrament of matrimony, all right? And so the sacrament of matrimony is an unbreakable covenant, a real union with God, a real participation but not a complete fulfillment in the life of heaven and most certainly ends with death. Until death do we part, right? Okay, but you still maintain that union with God. 
And so matrimony remains that symbol of union with God and still a, part- a, part- a participated reality of that union, still real union, and also for the reality, it remains a symbol of the union for the reality of the union among the entire human race in heaven with God. What does matrimony ultimately signify? The, the complete union of every single person in heaven, as if they were all married to each other minus conjugal life. This is where, this is where our, our, our brains have to stretch a little bit, okay? All right, this, the, the heavenly reality is different in that sense. Uh, the conjugal life inherent in earthly existence and reproduction is not possible, okay, in heaven, nor is it even needed. All right, so the sacraments, they don't exist in heaven. We receive the Eucharist today, right? We're going to, all right? That is a participation in the life of heaven. It really is coming, growing, receiving Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. We're receiving the Lord. We are coming to possess the Lord. We are becoming, to, we're, we are becoming more and more like him. We participate in that reality. But in heaven, we have the fullness of the reality. So everything the sacraments signify, we have the fullness of in heaven. We participate now partially, a little bit, so to speak. But we possess fully the heavenly realities. The sacraments do not exist in heaven since there's no need for participation in the realities of heaven when we possess the fullness of the heavenly realities that heavenly life represent to us here on earth. It's a great gift that we have in the sacraments. It's a great gift. We are allowed, we are permitted to participate through the sacraments, the sacramental life of the church, in heaven, just a little bit at a time. This is the already not yet principle. Do we participate in heaven? Yes. Are we fully there? No. Already but not yet principle. All right, so that which we participate in now through the sacraments, we receive fully in heaven in the resurrection. Everything comes together after the resurrection. And then so he says, for those who are deemed worthy to attain the coming age. And so nobody dies. And then we're all in union with God and with one another. Ultimately, that's God's plan. That's why matrimony is such an important symbol in, on earth today. All right? my, uh, my vocation to the priesthood is a very important symbol for the reality of heaven. Because there, I'm celibate. All right? I'm not married to another person on earth, right? And so that's a greater symbol as well, but doesn't mean that the sacrament matrimony does not symbolize that same kind of union, very similar kind of union, except the whole thing about the union is that that union is completely fulfilled. People live more like me now in heaven, right, than they do married couples, because married couples are joined to become one until death do you part. And, but that union still remains, while the conjugal life might go away, but now you're not only in union with one another, your spouse in heaven, you're in union with everybody the same way. That's a stretch for our minds to, to grab. Okay, so Jesus, he quotes the Sadducees' own law from Exodus 3, 2, and verse 6. So it's verses 2 and 6. This is the Torah. So the Exodus is part of the Torah. He says, that the dead would rise even Moses made known in the passage about the bush. God himself speaks from the burning bush. Remember this? Anyone saw Charlton Heston, Ten Commandments? Okay. We remember those things more than we do the Bible, you know? So anyway, Exodus 3, 2 and verse 6. Uh, 3 and 2, 3. So God himself, he speaks from the burning bush, proclaiming that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, they died, all right? But he's the God of them. So is God a God of living or a God of dead? Well, he's a God of the living because there's no such thing as a God of the dead. If people are truly dead, they have no need for God. There's no such thing as a God of the dead because there's no one to worship God if they're all dead. If you're a God, by nature being a God, people worship you, okay? If you're a God, all right? So if he is a, so there's no such thing as a God of the dead. All right, so obviously, Jacob and Abraham and Isaac, they're alive, obviously. And he has to be a God of the living. Okay, so these patriarchs were long deceased by Moses' time. And since only the living can have a God, and God claims to be God of the patriarchs, then God must somehow sustain them in life in that age to come. 
All right? And so he proves them wrong. It's a logical argument, but it's from their own understanding. They know this. So in the end, after the resurrection, all souls are in union with God and with one another in a complete and full covenantal, permanent, and heavenly way without need for earthly conjugal life. That's the main understanding there. And that's what he's explaining to these uh, Sadducees. And so, uh, and the, we, gotta, we, we gotta have to recall this, brothers and sisters, my children, the resurrection. It's what we live for. That's what we're all about, the eternal life. All right, and we have to keep that in mind. Not even death should scare us, should never frighten us, because it's not what we're, because this earthly life is not what we're about. So it's easy to understand why the Sadducees are confused. Just like us, there is so much confusion to understanding heavenly realities and truth. A lot of people actually have people receive the resurrection. They know people, their loved ones, they have died. And then they, they refer to them as their angel. That's not true. You can't become an angel. Angels are different. They're like the angels. I know scripture says that today, doesn't it? They're like the angels. All right? And that they're like them. I'm not sure what Jesus meant about that in that sentence. They're like the angels, uh, but they're really different from the angels. Okay? People who are human nature, they stay human nature. In the resurrected form, they're still human nature. Right? Angel nature is intellect. It's an intellectual nature, a little bit different. So people don't become angels after they die. They become glorified in their humanity, transfigured. And so we need to be careful about how we understand heaven. We always have a tendency to make heaven like earth. It's supposed to be their way around. We have to make earth like heaven. All right? We have to get, get back to that understanding. So in response to this attempt to ridicule his teaching about life after death, Jesus again proclaims a resurrection from the dead, the gift of eternal life. All right? we, can, we can trust in that. All right? A resurrection from the dead is the central message of Jesus. What is Jesus' central message? It's the resurrection from the dead. That's why we spend all those weeks of Easter on the resurrection. The whole year in the church revolves around the Easter season. The whole year in the church revol revolves around Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and Sunday, Easter. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday night, Easter Saturday night, Sunday morning, etc. Uh, those three days, most important days of the year. Okay? Why? It's Jesus' death and resurrection. It's his death and resurrection. Why is that important? Because we're going to die and then we're going to rise. Right? That's why it's so important. It's the, it's the pinnacle of everything. So Jesus continues to proclaim this. It changes life. It changes the way we live life when we actually believe and accept the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of ourselves, that that is coming as well. And so uh, a resurrection of the dead is the central message of Jesus and a message that offers us real hope where in our day and age we struggle with hope because there's too much focus on the world in general and not enough focus on heaven. This is our mistake, all right? We continue to focus too much on the world, too much on ourselves, too much on, I have to do this, it's up to me, all right? And that's our mistake. If we focused more on heaven, if we focused more on Jesus, then we would be able to be hopeful more and realize that it's not up to me. It doesn't depend on me. I don't have to do it this way. I don't have to do it. God has a plan. And my confidence in God is going to be stronger that way the more I focus on Jesus or these heavenly realities, and that's going to help me live differently, more faithfully, and with more hope. And so the gospel passage reminds us that all of our focus as Christians should be about gaining eternal life, that we live for heaven, not earth. It's the same, basically, this is the same message I preach every Sunday. Okay, every Sunday. It's the same thing. Get ready for your death. Be ready for uh, resurrection. Get ready for the resurrection. This is what we're, what we're preparing for. Eternal life, eternity, happiness of heaven. Nothing else is going to satisfy us. All right? Most of you are old enough to know that the earth doesn't offer happiness. It doesn't offer what God can offer. It doesn't put our souls at rest. It doesn't help us sleep better at night, no matter what we achieve in the world. And so the thought that life is stronger than death is our hope and consolation that brings us joy looking toward our future, looking forward, looking upward. 
All right, and so in this time where uh, we're facing uh, the Proposal 3 on Tuesday, uh, I do believe that um, Satan is much more active. This is a, it's a really big battle because I'm starting to feel it more and more. I've been feeling it last week, uh, actually the whole seven weeks, last seven weeks, and, um, and I know you are too. I know especially people who work for the pro-life movement, uh, they, they are attacked a little bit more, uh, and they do get a little bit more uh, Push back from people, uh, or through the to the de- from the devil directly. So we have to stay strong in this, and that's why uh, on um, what's today Sunday. Okay, so tomorrow, uh, so tomorrow night we're going to maintain the nine o'clock a.m. mass. But tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night we'll have a seven o'clock mass in for Thanksgiving uh, for the gift of human life, and then we're going to have a holy hour. So your prayers are needed. We need to uh, have prayers, and we have to pray for the defeat of Proposal Three. Um, as I talked about on All Saints Night, November 1st, uh, the human race will suffer more if this goes through. All right? The human race is going to suffer more. Uh, our suffering will be intensified. All right? Not that we're not going to survive it, because God always protects us. He's going to take care of us one way or the other. But a lot of people are starting to realize that uh, you know, time is short. We don't, we don't have all the time that we used to. And ever since Jesus Christ uh, ascended and then they sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we've been preaching a second coming of Christ. All right, the resurrection is all the underlying theme here. Yes, we believe in a resurrection, but no, we don't want to abort babies either. Okay, we, should, we should bring human life uh, and allow human life to live because God wanted that life for something, to do something good in the earth. And that's the whole thing about it, is that every single person is, is a gift to the earth, and, and, and every single person is a gift to one another. When we start seeing things like that, it changes the way we live. But, uh, there's a lot of people in our, in, our, in our world who see everybody else as an enemy. That's a very difficult way to live. All right, and so, uh, yes, there's a belief in the resurrection, but uh, yes, vote, uh, we want to vote no on Proposal 3 on Tuesday. And um, it's like all you're going to hear about it after this because it's going to be over one way or the other. Uh, and so um, we look at this reading today. We have a wonderful reading about the resurrection. The first reading, it's a kind of a gruesome reading uh, if you go to look back at the Maccabees. Uh, and we have this explanation of Jesus reproclaiming that things in heaven are not the way they are on earth. That earth is very sick, very disordered, and, and it definitely in need of a savior. And we have one, but we have to turn to him in our hearts regularly, consistently, prayerfully, and daily. That's going to put us in a better state, a better quality of life.